Lord, on this fifth Sunday of Lent, we look in the distance and we see Golgotha there, death ahead of us, the crucifixion ahead of us, and Lord, we are getting close. But Lord, even now, even as we look upon that event that is coming, Lord, you are doing something new within us. And during the season of Lent, you have guided us to this point, and Lord, you will guide us through the cross, through the pain, through the suffering, through Christ's passion, to the joy of resurrection. So Lord, as we look towards the cross, help us to know the new life that is found in you. Give us that new life today, Lord. Lord, guide our thoughts, guide our minds, guide my words as we explore the scriptures that you have given to us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As I was reading through the, this morning's Old Testament lesson from Isaiah, I was struck by that sentence, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Now, that sentence is a bit strange, especially in the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, there is a constant call for Israel to remember, to remember the ways that God has helped them, to remember the covenants that God has made with them, to remember their story as the people of God. But here in Isaiah, they are called to forget, to remember not. Now, we might be tempted to think that maybe God is telling Israel to forget all of the bad things that have happened to them. These words from God in Isaiah are spoken to Israel who is in exile in Babylon. They have experienced incredible loss and suffering. So maybe God is telling them to forget all those terrible things because he is going to rescue them. And I think that's, that's part of what God is saying here, but not all of it. Because right before God tells Israel to forget, Isaiah reminds the reader of the good things that God has done. Isaiah tells the reader about the Exodus, about God splitting the Red Sea in half and allowing Israel to pass through on dry land. He tells the reader about the chariots of Egypt being extinguished like a candle. And it's with that story immediately in mind that God says, remember not the former things. The Exodus is one of the former things. It's one of the things of old. So why would God want Israel to forget that? As I reflected on that passage, I thought a lot about the power of the past and the power that it has on us. So I've just turned 30 years old, and I'm getting to that point in my life where my childhood is just far enough from me for me to think about it in some sort of nostalgic way. Um, I think back to moments in my childhood, and they have sort of a warm glow around them. Maybe you have moments that you think back to as well. Maybe you have moments, maybe it's a particular movie or a song or just a feeling in the air that in an instant transports you back to a particular moment or a particular season in your life that you remember in a warm and rosy way. Remember fondly. And maybe those moments or seasons are like kind of the, the good old days to you. That's when things were good. That's when things were warm. That's when things were peaceful. I know when I think back on those warm moments, I somehow want them back again. I want to live them again. I want to feel them again. I want to reach back and somehow bring forward them so that whatever my current struggles are, whatever pain I'm going through right now can be solved by kind of the warm peace of the past. Maybe the warm peace of a life that hasn't experienced change yet. I think one of the best stories about the power of the past and the power that it holds on us is William Faulkner's short story, A Rose for Emily. A Rose for Emily uh, tells the story of Emily Grierson, who lives in Faulkner's fictional town of Jefferson, Mississippi. The story begins with Emily's funeral in the 1930s, and it's told through a series of flashbacks of Emily's life over the years. Emily was born into a family that was very prominent before the Civil War. It was one of those aristocratic families. But after the war, the family begins to decline. They fall through some hard times, and things don't work out for them. 
But despite this decline, Emily refuses to acknowledge that any change has taken place in her life. She remains locked in the past and does everything in her power to make sure that she is never affected by change. She lives in a family house built during the 1870s, and as new houses pop up around that house, Emily refuses to update anything, leaving the house as a vestige of a time long past. When Emily's controlling father dies, she refuses to turn over his body or acknowledge that he is dead. When Emily struggles to pay taxes after her father's death, the mayor of Jefferson, Mississippi, takes pity on her and overlooks her taxes. But when a new mayor comes into office and asks for Emily to start paying taxes, Emily, thinking that she's still a part of this aristocratic family, proudly says, I have no taxes in Jefferson. Wouldn't that be great if that was the way that it worked? And then there is her romantic life. And it's a romantic relationship with Homer Barron that's probably the most famous part of Faulkner's story. Homer is a northerner who courts Emily, but then disappears one day. Everyone in town thinks that that northerner Homer must have run away. But at the end of the story, the reader learns that Emily poisoned Homer because she was terrified of losing him. Emily would rather have Homer dead and with her than face a future where he might leave her. An uncertain future, that's what it would be. Now, A Rose for Emily is a creepy story. I have spared you from some of the grotesque details if you know this story from high school English class. I can tell you that when I read it in high school, I made the mistake of reading it right before bed, and I had a very poor night's sleep that night. But it's a story that shows the ways that the past can get a hold of us and become our identity. We can become so locked in the way that things were that we can't change. Emily refuses to change anything of her life, even as the world changes around her. And as she refuses to change, she has to exert more and more control to keep the past locked in place, even to the point of killing someone. Emily wants to live a past that she can control, Instead, instead of live a future that is somehow uncertain to her. And that is a temptation that we all face. We all want those warm moments of the past to be our life in the present. We want a life that is predictable and safe. And we might think that if we exert enough control on our life, if we set the conditions just right, the way that things always have been will become the way that things always will be. The dynamic of control and uncertainty is in some ways at the heart of what Paul is talking about in today's passage from Philippians. In the verses prior to today's passage, Paul lists all of his religious credentials, um, all the things from the past that would show his worth and value before God. So some of those credentials, like Emily, were her family lineage. Um, he is from the people of Israel. He is from the tribe of Benjamin. He calls himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. Some of his credentials are long-standing religious traditions that he participated in. He was circumcised on the eighth day and re religiously kept the Jewish law. And some of those credentials are how he preserved the traditions passed down to him and how rigid he was in preserving them. He was a Pharisee, and he persecuted the Christian movement that seemed to tear down historic Jewish religious traditions. All of these credentials pointed to the ways that Paul preserved the past, the way that things were. But then we hear the first verse in our reading, that reading from Philippians. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. Everything that Paul had is considered nothing in comparison to what he now has in Jesus. And not all of those things were bad things. Circumcision and one's identity as a part of the people of Israel, those are good gifts from God. But now, something has changed. Something new has happened. Something new has happened in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A new chapter has been written in the story of God and his people. 
And that new chapter beckons Paul out of his past ways of relating to God and invites him into something new and something better. Listen to what Paul says. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. What we hear in this passage from Philippians is Paul's move from the certain ways of Paul's path, the certainty that is given by that righteousness of the law into a potentially uncertain way of following Jesus. All those credentials that we just talked about, those were ways for Paul to control his standing before God. When Paul talks about that time in his life, he's very much focused on himself. He speaks of a righteousness that comes from himself, a righteousness that comes from within But now, now he depends on a righteousness that comes from God, that depends on faith, faith in Jesus. Righteousness no longer comes from Paul himself as if it ever had. Now it comes from God. Now it depends on what God has done in Paul's faith, in Jesus' faithfulness, God's trust in what Jesus has done and what God is doing in his life. Now, that move from righteousness of my own to righteousness from God, that sounds nice, but we also have to consider the uncertainty that comes with it. A righteousness of my own, a righteousness where I do things in order to earn God's favor, that's a righteousness that can be tightly controlled and managed by myself. It's a righteousness that comes on my terms and requires maintenance and preservation not any actual interior transformation of the soul. A righteousness from God that depends on faith, that is a path that is much less certain. What will God ask me to do? Where will God lead me? Jesus died on a cross. What does that mean for me? How will I suffer? These are all questions that Paul had to face, and we also have to face them. But for Paul, and for us, the uncertainty was worth it, and it is worth it for us. To know Christ and to know the power of his resurrection was worth it for Paul because that is where true life is found. A righteousness of my own, it looks to the past actions, it looks to my past actions as a way of securing my future. A righteousness from God that depends on faith looks to God alone to secure my future, because God is the only one who can actually secure that future. The life of faith might be uncertain. I might, know, I might not know exactly the course of my life, but it ends up leading to the only certain thing that we can cling to, and that is life with God and the resurrection that he promises. And I think that's why Paul says that we should forget what lies behind and strain towards what's ahead. And I think that's why God says to forget the former things in Isaiah. Remember what God says in Isaiah. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I am doing a new thing. When we dwell on the past, even the good things of God, the good things that God has done in the past, when we look at those things and don't allow them to propel us towards the new thing that God is doing, We're no longer open to the new thing that God might do in our lives, the thing that God is doing right now. That's not to say that the past is invaluable or bad. The past is a beautiful thing. I mean, I'm an Anglican priest. I stand here today tied to the history and tradition of our church. It's just that when we cling tightly to the past and don't allow it to inform our future with God, that's when we become trapped and miss out on what God is doing in the present. 
Right now, as we speak, we live in a world where Jesus is risen from the dead. When we say that mystery of faith in the Eucharist, notice that we don't say that Jesus has risen from the dead as if it is a past event. Jesus is risen from the dead. He is alive. We right now are living in the midst of the new thing that God is doing. Because of Jesus, everything has changed. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, God is redeeming you and he is redeeming me right now. He is bringing about new life in us right now as we speak. And one day, when Jesus returns and all things are set right, that redemption will be complete. So what about you? What does it look like for you to live in the midst of the new thing that God is doing? On this fifth Sunday of Lent, God is leading us through the wilderness of this Lenten season. We're journeying towards the cross together, and it is getting very close to us. What might God do in you, your life, the rest of this Lent? How might he transform you? Life with God is filled with transformation and change. It is filled with growth. It can be perplexing at times, and you might not always know what the path looks like ahead of you. I think about those words from Isaiah, that idea of God leading the people of Israel back to Jerusalem, back to that land that he had promised them, and leading them through a wilderness. The life of faith is a walk through the wilderness, but it is a walk with a God who is constantly giving us new life through those rivers in the wilderness. God isn't giving you a stagnant pool of water to drink from. He is giving you newness and beauty and fresh water that comes from him. It might be perplexing. It might be uncertain at times. But if you walk with God in the wilderness, if you know Christ and allow him to lead you, he will always lead you home and he will be the one to give you life. Amen.